The next speaker is Dr. Ravi Amravadi. He is an associate professor of hematology and oncology and is the co-leader of the therapeutics program within the Abramson Cancer Center. He's going to talk to us about the PATCH trial looking at hydroxychloroquine use for prevention of COVID-19 in healthcare workers. Ravi. Thank you, Charu. And I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for this invitation to an opportunity to present the final results of a randomized control study of hydroxychloroquine versus placebo for the prevention of COVID-19 in healthcare workers. Uh, I'm really honored to be able to speak after Dr. Fauci and I thank him for his service to the country and leadership during this cha these challenging times. So this is part of our larger trial program called the PATCH trial. And it's a collaboration between the departments of medicine, emergency medicine, pathology, microbiology, biostatistics. And this trial is led by myself and Dr. Benjamin Abella in emergency medicine shown in the middle there. And it was conducted by a talented team of clinical research coordinators, laboratory scientists, and our regulatory uh, uh, unit from the Abramson Cancer Center. Here are my disclosures. I launched the PATCH trial because I've been working for years understanding the anti-cancer properties of chloroquine derivatives. We and others have published numerous studies showing that at high doses, hydroxychloroquine blocks a pathway called autophagy, which is a, clear, which is a uh, cancer resistance mechanism to therapy. Hydroxychloroquine can be combined at very high doses with other anti-cancer drugs that in and of themselves are toxic. On the left, you can see a patient of mine who's been on this combination for six years who presented years ago with stage four melanoma and brain metastasis. So even during this COVID period, there's been increasing interest in the cancer world for hydroxychloroquine trials and we've launched four new trials during this time. Now, when COVID struck, one of the first papers that came out, a laboratory study from Wuhan, showed that chloroquine could infect clear cells that were infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, but also could prevent infection of those cells. Now, it was known for a while that chloroquine derivatives had anti-cancer antiviral properties in the laboratory and some anecdotal evidence that they may have a role in patients with viral dis disorders. And this has led to numerous clinical trials. In fact, I did a clinicaltrials.gov search last week, and I found a staggering 160 clinical trials registered for hydroxychloroquine around the world, and 82 of these studies were prevention studies. Despite so many trials, there are few peer-reviewed publications and few randomized control studies. <clears throat> So back in March, we launched the PATCH trial. <clears throat> PATCH stands for Prevention and Treatment of COVID-19 with Hydroxychloroquine. And we uh, came up with one protocol with three different sub-studies that tested hydroxychloroquine in three different contexts. Sub-study one, which is paused right now to do an interim analysis, is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study in, in uh, quarantined patients at home with PCR positivity for COVID-19, for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, Substudy number two is in hospitalized patients, which is a randomized study between low dose and high dose hydroxychloroquine. This study was stopped early because of clinical trials that showed hydroxychloroquine was not effective enough in, in hospitalized patients. Substudy three, which is our prevention study, and the study I'll be talking to you most about, was in hospital employees working at least 20 hours per week with COVID-19 patients. We enrolled subjects in the study from two Penn Medicine hospitals, and these were subjects that had direct contact with COVID-19 patients during a surge in Philadelphia of cases. We enrolled subjects, uh, we enrolled nurses, physicians, emergency room technicians, and respiratory therapists that were working in the emergency room or on a COVID-19 ward. Subjects were randomized to either hydroxychloroquine 600 milligrams daily or a matching placebo. Our initial estimate was we needed 200 subjects assuming a 
10% infection rate in the placebo arm. And in order to see that hydroxychloroquine was in fact better in placebo, we aimed for a 1% infection rate in the uh, HCQ arm. There is only one other uh, HCQ prophylaxis study that was published by Dr. Boulware and colleagues in Minnesota, and that had a different strategy. That was a post-exposure prophylaxis study, whereas this study is a pre-exposure prophylaxis study with a larger uh, dose of hydroxychloroquine used, and also molecular testing done on subjects along the way. So with each subject got a baseline four-week and eight-week nasopharyngeal swab with RT-PCR, as well as blood testing for antibodies using two different antibody platforms. Also, there was, get, there was a concern for toxicity with chloroquine derivatives, especially cardiac toxicity, although we had never seen that with our cancer studies. So we included serial EKGs into the study as well. Now we faced numerous challenges conducting this study and the perseverance of the, of the study team as well as support from Penn allowed us to make a conclusion that I'll share with you in a second. Some of these uh, challenges that we faced such as drug supply, funding and the lack of available SARS-CoV-2 testing were solved by partnerships and the generosity of our industry partners as well as philanthropic donors. The tsunami of HCQ news, on the other hand, was harder to overcome and certainly affected our accrual to the study. There are two points on this slide that need further attention. One is that while we were also, we were very concerned about the safety of the participants in the study, we were very concerned about the safety of the staff in the study who were entering COVID wards and the emergency room to recruit participants. And it's a real testament to our team that we had no safety issues in our staff. And I am just in awe of the dedication and courage of the staff in conducting this clinical trial. The last point is that this is the first randomized drug trial in Penn Medicine employees. And this required careful consideration of ethical concerns and approaches to avoid coercion and bias. And I wanna thank Dr. Abella for being on the ground every day to make sure that these ethical safeguards were in place and recruitment could be done properly. So moving on to the results, we enrolled between April and July, 132 subjects on this study during a surge in coronavirus cases and an increased hospitalization rate at that time at the Penn Med in the Penn Medicine system. We enrolled 132 subjects, mostly female nurses in the emergency room and COVID wards. And, at each, and these subjects were randomized between hydroxychloroquine and placebo. The overall infection rate in this population was relatively low at 6%. And unfortunately, there was no difference between participants taking hydroxychloroquine at 6.3% infection rate and those assigned to placebo at 6.6% infection rate. We had two pre-specified interim analyses in this study. And after the second interim analysis, we found that we had reached the futility criteria. Futility meaning that if we had continued enrolling on this study, we would not, it was not likely that we would change the outcome here in favor of hydroxychloroquine. We uh, reviewed this with our independent data safety and monitoring board, and they did recommend terminating the study and publishing the reports. And this was uh, published online today at, in JAMA Internal Medicine. The secondary outcomes in the study include safety. So we had no grade three to four adverse events, no hospitalizations and no deaths. And the only significant difference between uh, hydroxychloroquine and placebo was in diarrhea, and this is mild grade one to two diarrhea. On the right, we see serial EKGs show no difference in the change in QTC between four weeks and baseline in either HCQ or placebo. And in terms of COVID-19 outcomes, all eight participants who developed COVID-19 had mild disease, were not hospitalized and made a full recovery. 
So in conclusion, a relatively high dose of hydroxychloroquine for two months was safe and well tolerated with no EKG changes. The infection rate we saw in our population was low, suggesting that PPE and hospital procedures to prevent infection were effective. This was a small randomized control study and it was stopped early because of pre-specified futility criteria, which are shown on the left. And we'd found no difference in uh, infection rate between hydroxychloroquine and placebo, indicating this is not the drug to use to prevent coronavirus in healthcare workers. Uh, although unlikely, our study does not address the possibility that a larger study, maybe a much larger study in a different population may yield different results for hydroxychloroquine, but we question the feasibility of conducting such a study. Putting it all together, we believe that our efforts should be focused on other preventative modalities, namely the vaccines that Dr. Fauci is talking about, and these should be prioritized for clinical trials. In closing, I wanna thank the patch study team for a tremendous job, and especially Ben Abella, my uh, co-PI on this. We had incredible project management from Jennifer Walsh, regulatory support from Megan, Colleen, and Erica, data management from Mary. And then I wanna thank our oncology and uh, emergency medicine sub-investigators for enrolling patients, our cardiologist, Matt Hyman, our laboratory personnel and leadership from Mike Malone and Scott Hensley, and our talented clinical research coordinators, all young people, some of them medical students, some of them going to medical school, especially Eliana Jolkowski and Barb Biney. We got funding from a generous donation from Leonard and Madeline Abramson to get us started, and Cecilia and Mark Vonderheide gave us an additional supplemental donation that really helped. We appreciate Bob Vonderheide's willingness to allow us to use Cancer Center resources to conduct the study. And we had incredible oversight from our excellent data safety and monitoring board and numerous other committees that were uh, making sure we were doing the right thing. Sandoz supplied the drug supply and Quest supplied the testing. And I wanna thank especially the participants in this clinical trial as it's never been a more important time in history to participate in a clinical trial. Thank you very much for your attention.